William Dargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. When you hear some country cousin call Swing Your Partner, don't be a literal theme. It's only a square dance, not a rope party. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Case number 216. The number sticks in my mind, as does everything pertaining to the rhubarb, because it was off the beaten track. Nothing like the general run of stuff a confidential investigator tackled. Even the way it began was unusual. Very hush-hush, with elaborate secrecy safeguards. The kickoff was on a train. I'd gotten on in New York, the 1110 Express, as requested, and found myself a seat in the observation car, also as requested. Leaving Baltimore, someone was to spot me and join me. Confidentially, a man named Dexter Dean. Leaving Baltimore, my client did join me, as promised. A short fellow, impeccably dressed, with worry wrinkles that made his face look like a spider web. He flopped beside me. You're Barry Craig, of course. How can you be sure? Sure? Oh, no, I, I guess I can't be sure. So? Uh, you will please show me identification. Now well, we're getting smart. These credentials okay? Yes, fine. You, uh, you were teasing. Teaching? You go to the trouble to set up a top-secret meeting like this with an operative you only talk to on the phone. Be sure you're spelling to the right guy. Oh, well, I'm very often absurd. Uh, this sort of thing is, is new for me. Well, what's up? Well, if you listen, I own and operate a chemical plant in Greensville, Ohio. Uh, a small plant, but we do important work. Important meaning? Uh, a considerable portion of our product is sold to the government. Oh. In recent months, there have been a series of mishaps. Like? Fires, principally. Four, Mr. Craig, since last September. Four fires of undetermined origin. Meaning possibly of incendiary origin? Yes. Or putting it uh, baldly, uh, sabotage? Mind you, I, I, I don't actually know. Of course, the monetary loss to me and to stockholders has been considerable. But covered by insurance? Yes, yes, there has been insurance, but... Only enough to compensate for a portion of the loss. Well, what do the insurance people think of four fires in half a year? Oh, that's a good question. And the nub of my problem. There's been the devil to pay. I'm threatened with a total revocation of insurance if the outbreak of fires continues. Now, without proper insurance, Mr. Craig, we must close the plant. I imagine. You're a small plant, you say? Yes. How small? Oh, less than a dozen employees. And most of them are clerical, manual, and outside workers like uh, carriers and truckers without access to our restricted area of the plant, the, uh, the area where the fires have occurred. How many work in the restricted area where they can do mischief? Three men, and uh, myself, of course. But you're front office. No, no, we're, we're not that kind of a formalized plant. I supervise and oversee actively. I, I spend my day in work clothes. I am professionally a chemist. Like my father was before me. My my father founded the plan. I see. Now tell me, um, why did you set up our meeting this way? Me on a train and you joining me 200 miles out. Why all the cloak and dagger? Because I, I somehow have an unshakable suspicion that I'm being watched. Somebody watching to see what I do about the fires. I want nobody to know I'm engaging an undercover operative. Undercover operative? Explain that. I want you to come to work in our plant. Computing formulae, say. Well, I don't know the first thing about it. Well, I prepare advanced charts. You can pretend to be testing and rationalizing them. You'll be able to fake it nicely under my tutelage. But I'll actually be getting a line on your key workers. Eyes and ears open. Yes. Prove or disprove sabotage. Prove the fires were merely accidental. Matters of negligence only, so I can rest easy. Have renewed faith in my crew. Uh, you, of course, uh, have to use an assumed name. Well, good. Fine. I'll pay you well. And add burial expenses to the cab. Burial expenses? Saboteurs play rough. Well. 
Greensville is a community of neat clapboard homes and postage stamp lawns, a population that would get lost in the bleachers of the Yankee Stadium. One main street with the usual complement stores, the shoe factory that employed most of the town's breadwinners, and right at the edge of town, the Dexter Dean Chemical Company, my new place of employment. In the bright and early a.m., I showed up for work, looking wise and very scientific over a sheet of formulas that were Greek to me. Twenty feet from me, down the restricted room, a few key people were filling compressed tanks with liquid chemicals. A wholly mechanized bit, with a gadget wall of instruments and meter pressure readings that looked like something out of space fiction. Like any minute, the whole joint would take off for the planet Mars. Hiya. Gibbs, is it? Uh-huh. Gibbs. Walter Gibbs. I'm Ben Marlowe. Welcome to Dexter Dean Chemicals. Thanks. Where are you from? East, uh, Baltimore. The Haley Wilcox? Haley Wilcox? Chemical company in Baltimore. Oh, no. Never worked for them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm back at a trade I gave up eight years ago. Oh? Had to try it my own business for a while. Even had a government contract while it lasted. Well, I can't blame you for trying it solo. On your own, you can get rich. This way, never. Here you get a box of candy Christmas and a company diploma when you're 80. You sound bitter. I've been giving my all to good old Dexter Dean ten years now. No headway? A raise, five dollars at a time, spaced five years apart. Well, I quit. Pick up and try somewhere else. Mm, I like Greensville. I was born there. Oh, well, there's a whistle. It's lunch. I'm alone. I'm not. <laughs> a date every lunch, every day. Oh, she must have something. Mister, she has everything. Outside the plant, I saw Ben Marlowe's date go off with it. Everything was an understatement. Nature had really provided for this baby. Her name was Marcia. I knew that from the list and breakdown Dexter Dean had given me. Marcia was the company bookkeeper. I ate in the only place Greensville offered, a lunch wagon on Main Street, with a spick and span green to it. I ate alone, soup and pot roast. But I soon had company. Another inquisitive key employee anxious to cultivate me. Hi. Hello. I'll join you. Be my guest. Uh, Croquettes, Patsy. Have me on a gravy. I'm Clyde Soller. Walter Gibbs. A new chemist? Uh-huh. Well, there you croquettes. Fast service, eh? Yeah, Patsy's a wonder. Chief cook and bottle washer makes his own change. Wife's dead, raises three kids without help. A dynamo. A past the NACL. The uh, NACL? The sodium chloride. Well, translated into English. The salt. Some chemist you are. NACL is a basic chemical formula, high school stuff. Well, I'm a long time out of high school. Before you start clowning about the water, I'll pour you some H2O. You're frowning, cousin. Am I? Yeah, what about? Wondering. Why Dexter Dean's got you working on formulas. That worries you? In his, Dean's place. Must mean Dean's thinking of giving up active work, grooming you to replace him. It could mean that. So what? Well, frankly, I'm missed. Why? I rate the promotion to head chemist. I'm qualified. I've got seniority 12 years of my life. The typical Dean double cross. Harsh words. Dean brings them on himself. Doesn't anybody like the boss? We could, if Dean let us, but he won't. He's pompous, fuzzy-headed, self-centered, dead to the human issue around him. That's why I'm knocking myself out. Of... Well, you're living in Greensville, Wilson. The name is Gibbs. You know it's Gibbs. <laughs> I just want to see if you remembered your own name. Did you uh, think I wouldn't? A chemists are vague sometimes, absent-minded. And where did you say you were stopping? I didn't yet. The Hotel Wabash. $8 a week. Ten. They hike the price on you. Don't they usually to strangers in town? Well, I've got to get back to slaving over a hot formula. So long, Swanson. <laughs> the name's Salter. Looks like you've won every round so far. Looks like. But I wonder. I didn't quit the diner. I stood to a side of the door to watch a scene play out. My recent lunch companion, Clyde Salter. He'd floated over to the booth where Ben Marlowe sat with the girl, Marcia. I didn't need the scowls to tell me that there was bad blood between Dean's co-workers. I didn't even need the violence that broke loose to prove it to me. Two guys, Marlowe and Salter, in love with one girl. 
The Eternal Triangle. <laughs> My first day undercover in Greensville. A setup so far with every earmark of intrigue. That night, heading for my room and to bed, I got a better idea of the lively time I was in for. I'd hardly gotten in the door when the sky over Greensville fell on me. I slumped, grabbing at a guy's sleeve. My hand came away with a piece of metal. A cufflink. I barreled my fist around it before going to sleep. Come back to consciousness after a blackout, things look distorted. You see weird shapes and forms. I was seeing a lot of curves, floating circles. And then as my vision returned almost to normal, it took the shape of a body. And what a body. Can you get up? If you slip two hands under my armpits and hoist, lady... I never knew a man not to take advantage of the situation. Up with you. Oh, oh I'm riding a seahorse. You were really snug. Yeah, I was. But how did you know? Your head. That can't be the natural size. I mean, how did you know to come here and at this time? The thought of a body. Huh? I thought the roof had collapsed. I'm in the room downstairs, directly below you. Oh. Am I acquitted? Of what? Being an invisible attacker. How did you know my attacker was invisible? Aren't attackers always? You're good, baby. You're suspicious, mister. Pardon me while I check my pocket. I thought so. What? My wallet. It's been lifted. Maybe then robbery. Maybe. And maybe uh, another reason. Now, what other reason could there be for theft of a wallet? Oh, stuff in it besides money. Identification. You said it. I didn't. You know something, Marshal? Yes? If I had a dollar, I'd bet it. Bet what? That I'm not undercover to you. That you know exactly who I am. Yes, I do know. You're Barry Craig, the New York detective. You're the daughter of a witch? <laughs> In the plant office, I overheard Dexter Dean telephoning you long distance. He did it so secretly. Or you eavesdrop so expertly. Now tell me, who slugged me to find out whether Walter Gibbs was a native? I don't know. But I can try to guess. So try. Claude Salter. Continue fingering him. All right. I believe it was Clyde Salter who started all those fires. Maybe. I'm not sure. For one thing, hatred for Dexter Dean. Beans were made on a promotion from a soldier. And another thing? Hated for my fiancé, Ben Marlowe. I used to go with Clyde. I dropped Clyde for Ben. I believe Clyde planned to involve Ben. Have Ben blamed for those fights. But he hasn't in all this time? He tried. I frustrated him. How? When I told the fires, there were certain things belonging to Ben left at the scene. A hat once. Another time, Ben's fountain pen. I found them before anybody else did. Both articles stolen from Ben. Maybe not. Maybe your fiancé Ben did drop those things at the scene of the fire, and nobody tried to frame them. Oh, that's ridiculous. Your yeah, Ben has no more love for Dexter Green than Clyde Sauter has. Ben's right. No adequate raise in pay in ten years. You can spend circumstantial theories around all kinds of people, Marcia. But back to the guy who slugged me. I've got a clue to him. A clue? This coupling. I grabbed at it when I got hit. An initial coupling. Now let go, looks like. Here, look it over. H.T. What? Harry Tyler. And who's he? A former employee of Dexter Dean. He's here in Greensville. On the bomb. He was once plant engineer. Until? He had a violent row with Dexter Dean and was fired. A rankly ex-employee. With time and purpose enough to come calling on me with a lead pipe. Looks to me like I've really got a suspect. A disgruntled ex-employee whose cufflinks were initialed H.T., Harry Tyler. An ex-plant engineer now on the bum, as Marsha had put it. In a town the size of Greensville, there weren't many places a guy could be on the bum in. 
I tried the Odeon dance hall. Here served on the premises. Six couples were trying to live it up. Carlo wasn't among them. I next tried the one other place called the Sports Emporium. Cool and gentlemen figures. And in the back corner, a friendly dice table. The guy shooting answered the description Marcia had given me at Tyler. I waited until he'd lost his point. Then I pulled him to a side. Come here, Tyler. What do you want? Someone wants to see you outside. Outside, he does. Me. Hey, what's a joke? If you don't come outside quietly, I'll have to embarrass you in front of your friends. Embarrass? By dragging you out bodily. And what's this about? I'll tell you outside. Are we going? Outside, we found a quiet back street. That's all Greensville had. It was quiet back street. Empty your pockets. Uh, when are you, a stick-up man? You know who I am. I do. You read my identification. You've got my wallet. Mister, you're crazy. I hate doing this. That evens up one phase of our situation. Now on your feet and hand over my wallet. Here's your wallet. You didn't have it, huh? Here. Huh? What's this? Your cufflink. The cause of your downfall. Look, I... I didn't mean to pinch your wallet. There's the money in it, I mean. Eighty bucks. It's all there to the penny. I... I just wanted to know who you really were. I knew you'd blown into town. I was pretty sure you were here as an undercover investigator for Dexter Dean. And if I was, why did that bother you? Are you kidding? I'm asking. Those fires. Dexter Dean would love seeing them pinned on me. He'd love manipulating you so he could pin them on me. Just what brews between you and Dexter Dean? I used to work for him. I know. You were fired. I had the nerve to talk back to Dean. Call him a few names. The one thing Dean never forgives is not giving him his dignity, the pompous stuff shirt. And for that, a solid citizen like Dean, plus being a plant owner, would retaliate against you even with a big lie? Blame you for something someone else did? Yes, Dean would. What else does Dexter Dean dislike you for? The politics in this town. I don't mean political parties, mind you. I mean the honorary titles to this and that, Dean Parade, Marshal on Memorial Day, stuff like that. What about it? Well, Dean's hit on being top functionary in Greensville. He thinks it's his right by a fact of wealth and social position. And you competed with him? I made that mistake. I got more votes than Dean did. Twice. Votes for what? I was elected chairman of the community chest over Dean, and I replaced Dean as honorary fire marshal of the Greensville Fire Department. Well, that did it. Playing fire chief was dear to Dean's heart. So uh, Dean killed you? He fired me, hoping I'd go broke from being jobless and leave town so he could sneak back as fire chief, be the big all-round functionary again. Mm, it's quite a lot. I've heard of crazy feuds, but this one, mister. You going to arrest me? No, just stick around Greensville. Be on top. I'll be right here. <laughs> characters in a town so small you could bicycle through it in four minutes flat. The next a.m. I showed up for work again. Even though I was now as undercover as a gravy stain on a tuxedo front, I showed up anyhow, for what it might be worth. Same routine at the first day. The first chance he got, Clyde Stalder hopped over to heckle me. Morning. Morning, Stalder. I, uh, I picked up a hot rumor. About? You. I heard say you were a New York detective here doing a job of spying. As a spy, I've just been declassified. Seeing the secret's not only out, it's all over town. But I'm still a detective. Here to make an arrest? Here to find out the truth about four fires. Four fires I figure to be incendiary in origin. Who do you suspect? Everybody. And that includes me. Well, you're neck and neck for top honor. Marsha or Ben Marlowe or both of them have been steering you in my direction. Now, why would they? Marsha would see me dead. I left her standing at the altar three months ago. Not the way she tells it. Ask the townspeople. Yet you uh, slugged Ben Marlowe over Marsha yesterday in the lunchroom. I slugged Ben, but not over Marsha. Ben? Ben Marlowe drives an imported car at crazy speed. You're digressing. I'm not. Marlowe ran down and killed my boxer. I don't want to carry on about a dog with you, but you can guess how I feel. Yeah, I can guess. The man and his dog. I thought this town was only wacky a half hour ago. Now I think it's plain nuts. 
Between quitting time, there was a whistle. Loud enough to buckle your knees and send waves up your spine. When the plant was emptied, I huddled with Dexter Dean in his office. Oh, then you made no progress? No, except to find out that the plant isn't exactly one happy family. What do you mean? Nobody likes the boss, for one thing. You're harboring vipers, Dean. I'm unpopular with my employees? You're the plague. Oh, well, what, uh, what do you recommend? I recommend you make good on promises. Like the promotion Salter's been expecting, and the raise Marlowe's been expecting. A raise hefty enough for him to get married on. Remember, you asked me. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll make a note of your suggestion. Don't make notes. Do it. And now's the time to tell you that I'm about as undercover around here as a wrapper on a store cigar. Your real identity is known? Like all Greenville, the godparents at my christening. Oh, good heavens, then... Then it's fruitless to expect you to find the culprit. It's at least tougher, but we'll hope. Oh, you mind if I smoke? Why, no. You know, I've got cigarettes, but no matches. I uh, have some here. Some matches? You've got a million of them. What? Oh, well, they they seem to accumulate. Uh, a habit of boyhood, I suppose. I, I used to collect the covers of book matches. As boys will. Yes. Uh, may I light it for you? Please. Thanks. Hey, blow it out. Unless you hate your fingers. You said... The match. Blow it out. Oh, uh, I, uh, I'm absent-minded and uncoordinated. It's the, it's the unresolved problem here. My mind dwells on it. Well, I may come up with an answer. I'm still punching. That night, I took my constitutional down Main Street. The town was dead. Dark like a blackout, except for the one movie marquee. A first-run picture, Beat the Devil with Humphrey Bogart. I thought of going in to see it as an antidote for inaction when I heard the fire engine. A whole Greenville volunteer fire department, racing pell-mell toward the southern edge of town, where the Dexter Dean chemical plant was. And riding in the chief's car, wearing a big red helmet, was Harry Tyler. I was at the scene personally after five minutes sprint. The fire localized in the so-called restricted area of the plant. And a bunch of volunteer comedians making like mighty firemen. <laughs> More water hoses than people, it seemed, looking at the site. Everybody splashing everybody else and in between time wetting down the plant. Some. They were like kids squirting water pistols. And having more fun than anybody was my client himself, Dexter Dean. That night in the Hotel Wabash, I couldn't sleep. No reflection on the bed. The linen was fresh and the mattress free of cases. I couldn't sleep for thinking. When morning came, I had a tentative answer figured out to the five fire mystery. An answer strictly for the birds. So I opened the window and told it to the birds. The birds gave it right back to me. They'd lived in Greensville long enough to know to keep out of local affairs. I got dressed and went down to get Dexter Dean's reaction to my brainstorm. Dean was sitting in his chair looking shattered, but positively. Oh, last night's fire. My insurance will be revoked and never reinstated. I'm ruined, Craig. Sad. But I'll have one consolation. What? The Dexter Dean Chemical Company will close its doors. Every ingrate in my employ will be unemployed. Paupers applying to the community chest. That pleases you? One of them is a despicable arsonist. Maybe not an arsonist. Not? An arsonist sets fires consciously. He has a motive. Profit or revenge. He knows what he's doing. Now, on the other hand, there's a type firebug classified as a pyromaniac. Pyromaniac? A psychiatric classification for a guy who enjoys starting fires. For the kicks in it. He starts them, then even hangs around to watch the blaze. This fellow isn't always conscious of his urge. Well, that's difficult to understand. I know, but it's so. He has an irresistible urge to set fires. It's something off in his head, say. And maybe in his psyche. I'll leave the clinical accuracies to a doctor. Anyhow, about this character. 
Think of him as a Jekyll and Hyde. With Jekyll, he doesn't know what Hyde is doing and vice versa. Well, it's much too confused for me to follow. Uh, I'll think of another way to get my thought across. Mind if I smoke me now? Why, no. Well, as usual, I've got smokes in every pocket, but no a match. I have. <laughs> my, <clears throat> my fantastic accumulation of matches. You're not kidding. Fantastic. May I... May I light it for you? Don't bother. Give me the book. This time on a borrowed match, I watched Dean's eyes react to the burning match. He stayed with the flame as if hypnotized by it. I let the match burn out, then I lit another. Still hypnotized, staring as if he read some mysterious secret lost to mankind in the flame. I lit my cigarette this time and threw the lighted match into Dean's wastebasket. A wastebasket crammed with papers. An immediate bonfire started, with Dean now really in a trance. Dean. Yes? Your wastebasket's on fire. Yes, it, it is. Pyromania, the type guy who enjoys fire. They thrill him, Dean. Yes. The thrill of beauty. The beauty. Our pyromaniac, Dean. As a kid, he played with matches, rode on the fire engine. And when he grew up, he liked wearing a fire chief's hat and officiating a fire. Fires he often started himself. Dean, come out of it. Uh, yes, Craig? The fire in the wastebasket is burning itself out. It's a metal basket. We've solved your five fires. You started them yourself. I... I have a blinding headache, Craig. I imagine the weird visions you see in flames. Write out a check for my time and effort here in Greensville. Then hurry out of here to the insurance people and then to a doctor. Tell him all about yourself, and when you're done, follow his advice religiously. My check for services rendered, Dean, before I go to pot in Greensville. <laughs> Listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Strange Vision, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled Death Wins a Bet, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week's story title suggests the idea that it never pays to make any bets about death, because he's got the game fixed. Everybody dies, but in this particular case, death gets an assist. From whom? <laughs> Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Featured in the role of Marsha was Barbara Baxley. Don Pardo speaking. <laughs>